It is on now. Give your shout out. Now, you guys are supposed to tell him your, your Twitter address, too. Right? you got to give a Twitter. At Hawkeye underscore Andrew. There we go. Got it. Got it. All right. So, last week we ended with the Dutch. Ah, the wonderful Dutch. Love those guys, right? Am I correct? Is that about where we left off? So, getting back to kind of an overall picture of what's happening around Europe in the 17th and 18th centuries. So, now to Sweden. So, tell me, Sweden, you typically don't hear of the Swedes as doing much at this time, right? But that's actually false. They were actually quite the empire at this time. Because remind me, when were they at their highest point? Well, they're But yeah, right here. But when were the speeds at their highest point in their history? The 30 years war. Oh, the 30 years war, indeed. Under which king? Gustavus Adolphus, yes! So we have the Gustavus Adolphus sword of doom here. Uh, so. I know, I know. You guys are killing it. All right, so uh, they will hit their high point during this time. Because why? Why did Gustavus Adolphus make them hit their high point military in their strategy. Yeah. What? Military, military strategies. Military strategies. Brilliant. Yeah. Absolutely. So he did some... Uh, some so he just some, did some terrible things in Europe, but it was very effective. I mean, uh, remember, what were the terrible ways in which he raised sufficient funds? Swedish cocktails. And what else? And the bronze shot soon. Good. Okay. What is this hollow? What is this hollow? What am I missing here? Yeah. 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 I was trying to figure out, I couldn't remember what the, like, title of the whole thing was called. Yeah. Yeah. You got it now? Yeah, yeah. I did. 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 I Okay, good. So, hitting the high point during the Thirty Years' War. And so Gustavus Adolphus, he is going to be able to expand the Swedish Empire around the Baltic Sea. So yes, he dies in battle, the Battle of uh, Lutzen. And uh, he is going to, therefore, be killed. But his sister is sitting on the throne back in Sweden. And then she, unfortunately for her, is not a big fan of being the ruler. She doesn't like being the ruler. So, anyone know, who is going to be at the helm of this great state? Charles. Huh? Was she? I just her name was Christina. Yes. So who's going to be at the helm of this great state since the queen is not all that interested? The prince. Huh? Charles. All right. It's the Reichstag. They've got themselves a Reichstag over here in Sweden. And so uh, they are going to be uh, a representative assembly trying to run this thing as a constitutional monarchy. The monarch's not all that interested, but they will do a great job expanding along the Baltic and taking all of these lovely possessions around here. So, they are going to be a dominant power on the Baltic. However, they will see their decline under the leadership of that young man. Who is that young man? Charles. Charles, indeed. So, Charles the 12th is going to come in as an 18-year-old king. So as an 18-year-old king, he is in possession of quite an empire, considering uh, how the rest of Europe is looking at this time. Doing pretty darn good. However, who wants in on the Baltic because they are, so far, a landlocked state? Russia. Russia. All right, excuse me. Landlocked in the West. In the West, they are a landlocked state. So Peter the Great wants to expand to make sure that he has some warm water ports. Not cold water ports that are frozen all year round except for three months. All right, so he's looking for that warm water port. The best way to get it is through a massive war. It's called the Great Northern War. It's going to last for 21 years before Charles is finally killed in battle and therefore sees the end of the Swedish Empire. What was that? A warm water port. All right, so the warm water port would be right along here is what he's going to be taking. He's going to build St. Petersburg right, right over here as well, uh, right over there. Okay, and so they're going to be uh, doing this at the expense of the dirty speeds. All right, we got all that? Good, that's Sweden. So now let's take a look at the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Remember it used to be called the HRE, the Holy Roman Empire, but as of the Thirty Years' War, can they really call themselves that anymore? No. No, there will be more Holy Roman Emperors that will continue to try and call themselves that. By the way, what's their dynastic succession name? Habsburg. Habsburg, indeed. And so the Habsburgs will continue to try and call themselves that, but most people are kind of like, yeah, whatever, after 1648. And so they're starting to expand more to the south and the east at the expense of the Ottoman Turks and the Hungarians. So, the Austrian Empire, as it's going to be called for a while here, uh, the Austrian Empire, they are what's left of the HRE. 
and, uh, or excuse me, of the vestiges of the HRE. And they're the House of Habsburg, as we said. Uh, I have the uh, different spelling for you here. Sorry, I spelled it with a P this time instead of a B, um, rather than the Germanic spelling of, with the B. But either way, it works. And they will be defeated by France and the German princes in 1648. So the, uh, what was the treaty, by the way, that ended this war, the Thirty Years' War? Versailles. No. Keep saying that. When in doubt, go for Versailles. <laughs> no, no. Okay. So that's on the 20th century. We'll get to that later. All right, so, 30 Years' War was ended by what first international peace treaty in world history? No? Westphalia! Oh, no! The 30 Years' War! We need a review! When was the 30 Years' War? 1618 to 1648. 1618 to 1648. Tell me the four phases of the Thirty Years' War in order. Uh, Danish. No. Bohemian. 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 Von Albert von Wallenstein. All right, Albert von Wallenstein. And so he's going to come in and start kicking some serious tail for the Catholics. In fact, kicking too much tail, which will mean the emperor will not like him and he will dismiss him. Which means the third phase of the Thirty Years' War, the Swedish phase. Indeed, so the Swedish phase is when they come in. Uh, and that was whom again? Gustavus Adolphus and his sort of doom, indeed. And so the Protestants start rallying big time. It will end the Habsburg aggression in the north. But while the dog is about to be down on the ground, in come the French to kick him even harder, right? And so, what was that phase called? French or international. French or international phase. And it ended with which first international peace treaty in world history? Westphalia. 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 Why do we call it the first international peace treaty in world history? Peace in Westphalia. Because all, all of them met together. We took so there you go. All of them yeah. met together. Every so single yeah, person yeah, that was involved. Like, there was something like a hundred different princes. What was that, James? <laughs> you said it too? I said peace in Westphalia like four times. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. like, I don't know, right after I said Versailles. Yeah, see, I didn't hear him. And plus, I was disgruntled that it was just one person saying it, not all of you, which should know okay, it by this time. <laughs> right? Okay. So, so uh, the nice thing, though, to get back to what we were talking about, the nice thing for the Habsburgs is they are still a major continental power. Do they have a big baby? No. no, in fact, they have almost no navy that I can ever think of. I, don't, I really don't think they have a navy. But they have a huge army, huge continental army, because they know they need to counter Louis on the continent. So the Habsburgs, they are starting to look east. <laughs> All right, and so the Ottomans, meanwhile, they are on the wane at this point. On the wane because under Suleiman the Magnificent, they are uh, they were doing pretty well for a while, but then they're going to make a, a big mistake here because under Suleiman they were expanding. They're expanding uh, into out of Turkey and into the southeast of Europe, right? But what's the big mistake that they're going to make? Siege of Vienna. There you go. So they're going to try and take out the Habsburgs at the Siege of Vienna, which will be a failure. The reason it was such a failure was, for for instance, they were uh, outside of Vienna for quite some time, and it was uh, difficult to maintain the siege because the Viennese still maintained a water source. They still had enough supplies. They were still able to, to live in the city, so therefore that was ineffective. The other thing that made it cool and ineffective was because uh, the, the Viennese, or excuse me, the Austrian Habsburgs hired a bunch of mercenaries called the Polish Hussar Cavalry. You can see them right here. The Polish Hussar Cavalry. Now, do you, all right, you guys know, know what makes these guys super cool? The wings. The wings, all right? These guys are Catholic cavalrymen, first of all. Secondly, they actually wore these in battle. They wore wings that looked like angel wings, but they also put metal tips on these things. So that way, when they rode into battle, they made a loud noise, like a yeah! noise as they were riding furiously into battle and so i mean it terrified their enemies and the, the, the turks they're quite the soldiers but the turks they're like oh and they had to run away right so they had to run away from the hussars so austria hungary then is going to see some of its i guess you could call it a high point they're starting to uh to come back from that 30 years war starting to see a, a resurgence under the rulership of charles the sixth now, Charles VI, though, is still going to have some issues, though, because uh, he's having a hard time 
dealing with the issue of labor. So he's going to uphold the institution of serfdom and in, in fact reinforce the institution of serfdom, whereas most of Western Europe had gotten rid of it by this time. And they're going to establish a little thing called the robot. Now the robot is not the, you know, the, the cool robot that you're thinking of here. No, uh, instead what it means is they owe labor to their lord, right? So what he's essentially saying is to the lords of the, each manor, his nobles, right? So to all of his no nobles, uh, they're called Magyars. He's telling the Magyars, hey guys, you may enforce serfdom and you may require up to five days of labor from your serfs, meaning they work for free for five days. What's that leave for them to be able to work for themselves so they can actually eat and pay the taxes? Two days if they're breaking the Sabbath, one if they are not, right? And so that's not very good for the serfs, not very good at all. But that's, the, you know, it's, it's hard out here for a serf. That's what he gets. All right, and so uh, the Hungarians, meanwhile, they're going to revolt because the king was trying to break, make it so that, uh, by the way, what is the language of the Austrian Empire if you're Austrian? German! Yes, so they're speaking German, culturally German, portly, and in the port they're speaking French. But the cultural language of the Austrian Habsburgs is German. All right, so they were trying to impose many German cultural things like language on the Hungarians. And how did the Hungarian Magyars feel about that? Okay, you guys remember which group helped invade Europe in the 9th century? We had the Muslims, we had the Vikings, and we had the. Magyars, right? So we had the Magyars. So the Magyars since the 9th century have been pissed, right? They, they are an angry tribal type of group, and you don't want to mess with the Magyars. So uh, what is Charles VI going to have to tell the Magyars? Okay. Before it was called the Austrian Empire, post 30 years war. Now what are they going to have to start to call it? The Austro-Hungarian Empire. Essentially, he's saying, hey guys, you are a part of this empire. The Magyar nobility, you guys get to be a part of this system as well. The Habsburgs run it, but the Magyars participate. Does that sound like full absolutism? No, it does not. He's compromising, making big compromises here, right? Because there's nothing he can do about it. So he's going to be dependent upon noble cooperation here, which is not going to work out real well for him. So some discussion questions to get your brains working here. Uh, you guys all read Stephen Lee, correct? Yes, two. Only three of you. Yeah, I'll make you uncomfortable here and see what kind of answers you got. So based on your reading of Stephen Lee, discuss the following questions in your study groups. What kinds of things influenced the monarchs of the Austrian Empire to reform? What made these monarchs reform? What areas of the empire were in need of reform? What was the role of the Enlightenment on Maria Theresa's reforms and Joseph II's reforms? Hopefully these names sound familiar. How did the nobility and peasantry respond? And what does this reveal about Joseph II's application of idealistic reform? And who were the great enlightened despots? What was the importance of the theoretical contract to the success of enlightened despotism? Ready, set, go. I have a question. Yes. That's a super question. Yeah, I'm sorry. I skipped him. Yeah, so, that, so I mean, the chapter deals with this. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
<laughs> and all my predecessors, though. I'm off to another school. Maybe I'll fall in. And you wouldn't know it. Good things I shouldn't have. Absolutely. In fact, I feel guilty for spending like two weeks on this. It's not on this. You don't have a Twitter. So, top two is really where everything begins. All right. So, Maria Teresa. She's going to come in as the new ruler in 1740. Now, let me set the context here. We've not gotten to Prussia yet, right? But Prussia is becoming big time at this point. Prussia is her neighbor to the north, so to speak. And uh, so there is going to be a huge competition between her and the king of Prussia who wants all of her land. And he, by the way, will come to the throne at the exact same, well, in the exact same year that she does. So these two are going to have an epic bout that is coming up. We'll talk more about it when we actually see Prussia. But Maria Theresa, what I'm t telling you here is she's got some tough business right when she comes to the throne. First of all, what is she? She's a woman. She's a woman! Yes, and she is the head of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Wait a second, how does that work? I mean, what was her father even thinking on this one? Was, she, was he thinking that everyone would listen to her? He was hoping, wasn't he? Now, why did he think they might? She had influence. Ah, she had influence. She's tough. And the pragmatic sanction. All right, so uh, who, would, who, who knows what pragmatic means? Pragmatism. Yeah, practical. Practical. Very good. So this is kind of a practical law here, a practical idea for Charles. Because, you see, Charles VI, he uh, had no more male babies. Had no male babies that were going to be able to assume the throne. He had Maria Theresa. And Maria Theresa was his only uh, way to legitimately, through his bloodline, pass the throne to someone. This has never been done in Austrian uh, history. It was done in England, and he saw that it worked all right when Elizabeth uh, took the throne after Mary, right, after Edward, because they were all out of other options. And so, uh, so at this point, he's thinking, maybe all of Europe will agree if I pass around this note saying, hey guys, here's my pragmatic sanction, I've got no other options, Maria Theresa, when I kick the bucket, we'll take the throne. And everyone in Europe's gonna say, yeah, yeah, totally, let's yeah, we'll go with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. Are they going to listen? No. no! Because as soon as he kicks the bucket, what are they going to do? They're going to try and take over. So, Frederick the Great in Prussia will be the first one to attack her in the War of Austrian Succession. Everyone else sees an opportunity to weaken the power of the Austrian Habsburgs because they are a powerful group countering France at this time. And so, everybody is going to go to war against Austria here and try and kick their tails. Except Britain, because Britain always feels bad for the underdogs. So they're like, no, you can't do that. And then they get on the side of the, uh, the, the losing side. So, uh, in the War of Austrian Succession, um, we're going to see that Maria Theresa is going to get her tail handed to her on a silver platter by all of her enemies, right? Not going well. And so, war will expedite reform. That's one of the big things in Stephen Lee. When we take a quiz or test questions on Stephen Lee, you will see test questions on Stephen Lee under multiple choice exams, so therefore I recommend you read it. Uh, one of the big things that he talks about uh, is that war expedited reform. What's that mean? It sped up. It forced these reforms. Because without this war, they might have just kept going with their antiquated system, and it might have just kept continued sucking for thousands of years. Well, because of this war, it proved to them we need to change things big time. We got beat mercilessly by these continental powers, right? One of which was Prussia, which, you know, beat us in Silesia within a couple of months and took it. All right? So, uh, so what they're going to do is start to separate their powers, which is interesting because it's not an absolutist type of tactic. By separating the powers and, and creating a judiciary so that they can start to run the laws rather than the king, or in this case queen, being the only one responsible for the laws, that's going to be a big change. Another one is they're going to start to use mercantilism. They're going to start to uh, use the government to pay and subsidize things like early forms of industry because they know that they cannot survive unless they have some kind of industrial production of some products, including especially what? What kind of products do we need? War products, war products, uniforms. So therefore, if you're making uniforms industrially, you're making them faster, you need what kind of raw material? Wool. All right. So, mercantilist policy. Then she's also going to weaken the authority of the church, which is ironic, because what religion is she? Mom, what religion is she? Catholic! And so, since she is a Catholic, why would she weaken the authority of the church? What do you think? She wants more control. Yeah, because the church was wielding too much influence in preventing her from being able to do her politicking. All right, so, she will weaken the church as well. And that will uh, be a big step in the, you know, right direction here for their authority. Now, the problem, though, is that with the end of the War of Austrian Succession, one of the th th deals in the peace terms that were handed to Austria 
They said, all right, Maria Teresa, you may remain on the throne since we just kicked your tail mercilessly in war, but your son, your very young son, Joseph II, needs to be your co-ruler, right? What that meant is uh, Maria Teresa nodded and smiled. She didn't really trust her son with doing much ruling, and she said, sure, he'll be co-ruler, but he won't do anything, all right, until I die. And so, when she finally died in 1780, he is going to assume the throne for himself here. He will rule for 10 years, and he is what we call an enlightened despot. What does that mean? What is a despot? Uh, like a dictator? All right, so a dictator, and what's enlightened despot mean? A smart. a smart one. So, reason is the dictator of my empire. That's what, uh, that is what Joseph II said, that reason will determine the way his empire is run. Why is that a big change, say, from, for instance, Louis? Was Louis influenced by the Enlightenment? No. No. In fact, it's probably a little too early for the Enlightenment anyway. Uh, a subsequent Louis, the 15th and 16th, will try enlightened despotism. Won't work, because they won't be despots. They will be enlightened, but they will not be despots. Why is this important, to think about enlightened despotism? Because they'll use new tactics to suppress the people. Okay, good. Not only to, su yeah, to suppress the people, but... Do you need to suppress the people if you're using reason and enlightenment to better you make the them country? Think that happy there you go. So you make a better country. Hopefully you have a happy populace, but you make a better country by trying to better the state. And if the people are happy, yeah, fantastic. That's good. So reason and philosophy are your guide, and the authority is a must here. You must have authority to come along with your reason and philosophy. So it's kind of like this, right? I've got an uppity group over here. I crush them mercilessly with an iron fist. I punch them in the face several times, break a few noses, call it good, walk away, right? Do I look like a jerk? Yep. Oh. Yeah. All right. So the enlightened, you know, the despots out there, the fellow absolutists out there are like, yeah, they totally had it coming. All right. Thomas Hobbes, totally had it coming. However, if I'm going to be like, hey, you have been disrupting everyone else, therefore I punch you in the face, right? Hey, you're not doing your job well enough, therefore everyone suffers, I punch you in the face, right? I kick you in the shins because you're not doing your job well enough. But I don't kill you because I'm against killing, right? So can you see how that looks a little better? Yep. Yeah, and then this side benefits, and they still get beaten in the face or the shins, but they get the message, don't they? They get the message. So, that's essentially enlightened despotism. They have the authority, the iron fist, but it's got a velvet glove, right? A velvet glove uh, covering that iron fist. So, the theoretical contract that Stephen Lee talks about is that we have enlightened rule from above, but what do we have from below? Absolute, total obedience, no questioning. All right, if the king wants to allow religious toleration, do you say anything about it? No. Even if you're a hardcore anti-Semite, do you say anything about it? No. Even if you're a, a cardinal? No. You say nothing about it, all right? If the king wants to allow freedom of the press, woo! That's exciting. That's an enlightenment ideal. But does that mean you blast the king? No. No! You have freedom to not blast the king now, right? That's what freedom of the press means in an enlightened despot state. All right, so essentially what they're saying is you need to allow the reason and the everything to uh, bring about reforms, but that doesn't mean you test the limits of those reforms, right? Do you think that's going to be the case for Joseph here? Is that how it's going to go for him? No. That he brings in all these wonderful reforms and everyone just loves him for it? No. No, no it's kind of sad. I feel bad for Joseph II. He's totally a cool dude. He wants to change things and make it better, but everybody hates him for it. That's kind of a bummer. Everybody thinks he's an idiot. Okay, so first of all, he will abolish serfdom. Sorry, my arrow's not there. It'll come later. So he will abolish serfdom. Isn't that a cool thing? So I mean, really, getting rid of the enslavement of these millions of serfs. Now they can be free. But the problem is, they don't know what to do with that freedom. They're not used to being free. They're used to having someone tell them what to do. And then when he comes in and he's like, hey, now that you guys are peasants, I want you to increase your production. You heard about the agricultural revolution? They're using science to bring about better agricultural uh, products. Guess what? I'm going to make you do that. Let me show you how to drill and how to seed and how to do your, uh, your plowing a little more effectively. And they're going to say, oh, what? No. No, you do not touch my plow. No. I have seeded in this way for the last thousand years. This is how Grandpa did it. Grandpa before him did it. Grandpa before him did it that way. And I'm going to do it that way, dang it. And so then they will actually have a rebellion. They will actually, yes, they will actually get, grab their torches, pitchforks, and whatever guns they can get and have a rebellion against the king for trying to bring about more food. <sighs> Idiots! Idiots! All right. Another thing he's going to do is weaken the judicial power of the nobility, essentially getting rid of the manorial court. Getting rid of the manorial court, which used Roman law, meaning the lord of the manor, the Magyar, he gets to have final say on all things. He's going to get rid of that power. So how are the Magyars going to feel? He brought it in and he can get out of here. 
So, what was that? Wait, wait, what now? The lady yes, she, she assisted with it, right? She assisted with it. Her father, before her, uh, I guess strengthened it, right? Charles VI strengthens the, the noble court and their noble status. She goes along with it. He tries to completely overrule it. How are the Magyars going to respond? Hate him, rebel against him, and then they'll get the peasants involved because they hate his new farming tactics. They think these new plows are just too cool, and they don't like it. So peasant revolts are going to be the effect here uh, towards the end of his reign. And so, I mean, he kept saying, why are people so unhappy? I'm doing good things here. And yet they just absolutely loathe him for it. All right. So another thing he's going to do is bring in religious toleration. He's going to, to allow Jews to come into Austria, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and practice freely. That should be a pretty cool thing, isn't it? Except to all the anti-Semites out there. And boy, there are a lot of anti-Semites out there, right? And so, a little bit heavy-handed in his application, too, because he's going to come in and say, you're doing it now, and you're doing it right this way, right? Protestants are allowed to come in, too. How's the church going to feel about it? Hate it. Yeah, all right. So, censorship. He's going to get rid of censorship in 1781, because that's one of the number one things of the Enlightenment. You do not censor the press. And so, uh, what effect will that have since they've been pissed off for the last couple hundred years? Lots of criticism, right? They're just going to start taking it out on the king. The poor king, he's trying to be such a good guy. They just hate him for it. Absolutely hate him. So, what do you think? Theoretical contract. What is it again? Okay, rule through reason, and then uh, everyone is going to obey it, right? You rule through reason, and everyone obeys it. How's it been working here? It's been working terribly, hasn't it? Okay, so some good examples of how it's been working terribly? Peasant revolts. Peasant revolts, good. All right, other things not going well here for Joseph. Criticism. Religious toleration. Nobody likes it, except, you know, maybe the few Jews that did show up in Europe, or excuse me, in Austria, uh, to freely practice. Okay, and then uh, what was the other one? The nobility are going to rebel as well. Very good. Okay, that brings us to Prussia. We're going to get started on Prussia. So you should have the new notes on Prussia if you don't already. And I'm glad to say these ones have blanks. So maybe you guys won't be zoning out so much. It's a awesome. I'm tired too. Is there a reason why we didn't do constitutional? Yeah. We, we had one more on that. Yeah. Yeah. No, nope, skipped it. Oh, all right, all right. Fair enough. Ready? No, not yet. Well, just no. a second. Ready. <laughs> yeah, indeed. You got, it's okay, because you guys are just confirming for me that I need to have blanks. Lots of blanks. No, no, I was no, no. Going on. I'm sure you were, but you were distracting me with your artwork. This is where the velvet glove comes up. No, I still have the bag on because I was being nice. I was being nice and saying, you know what, this just tells me something. Yes, I was being nice. I was being nice and saying, you know what, this just tells me something. If I were Louis, I would deprive her of her noble status. I would remove the iPad to send a message to the rest. Who might be doing it that I don't know about, I mean, right? I kind of feel bad for Alex because there's no way she's going to understand what's going on right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Party here. Alex, Alex with underscore Andrew, follow me. Or, yeah. Party. Nah, I, that, that's lovely. Why but, is no. the whole pass the room? Why is it Clint? Clint, 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 Clint. Uh, I had to get rid of it. That's a long story. I'll tell you later when I'm not being recorded by YouTube. All right. So <laughs> while that's downloading for you, while that is downloading for you, let me tell you a little bit about Russia. So, Prussia, when we're talking about Prussia, this is modern-day Germany, right? But this isn't the nice Germans that you might think of when you go to Germany today. This isn't the cuckoo clock-making, lederhosen-wearing, beer-drinking, football-loving Germans of Bavaria, right? Those are the nice guys that we like with their waxen mustaches and their fun lederhosen and yodel attire, right? Those are the fun Germans. All right, no, these are the northern Germans, the scary, militaristic, pointy-helmet-wearing, goose-stepping Germans that will bring about World Wars all in two. These are the hardcore Germans that you don't want to mess with, right? So Prussia, this is where we see the foundation of what is what will become Nazism, ultimately will become Nazism. Much of the Nazi history and their love of the military and their love of despotism will come from the ideas that come about in the 1640s here with Prussia. So, Prussia is hardcore. That's what we're getting at here. Prussia is the ultimate in hardcore. So let me just show you what Prussia looks like at this time. So, uh, Prussia in 1700. This is before we get to Frederick Wilhelm I and Frederick the Great. This is the colors that we've got. What do you notice about 
Prussia, dark green. It's scattered. Okay, it's scattered. It's incredibly scattered, right? We have one port city, and it's just barely on a port either. It's Königsberg. And Königsberg, anyone know what that stands for? Kunig is uh, German for king, so king city. All right, and then, uh, so we have very few major port cities, so it's pretty much a landlocked state, for, uh, you could say. Um, and plus, tell me about its neighborhood. What kind of neighborhood do we have here? Uh, Tough neighborhood. Why? Why is this kind of the ghetto right now? Okay, it has been decentralized by the effects of the Thirty Years' War, right? Decentralized, meaning that there are far more uh, princes that are seeking their own power, and the way to seek their own power after the Thirty Years' War enduring is to what? Raise a what? An army. And so if you don't have an army at this time, somebody's going to take you over, right? Somebody's going to take you over and take all your land and make you pay for it. Okay, so, uh, so Prussia at this point is realizing we need to keep up. And now that there's a 30 years war on our hand, and we are Protestants, we definitely need a what? An army. An army! Oh, yes, okay. So, they're living in a tough neighborhood. They know that they got to do something. And so, the first guy that's going to come around to do this for us is uh, named Friedrich Wilhelm the Great Elector. Now, you're going to notice when we're doing these names of kings, it's pretty easy to remember them, I think, because there's not a whole lot of differentiation, right? I mean, at least in Austria, there's like Leopolds and Ferdinands and Charleses and Maria Theresa's and Joseph's, right? Lots of different names. But here in Prussia, it's either a Friedrich, a Friedrich Wilhelm, or it's going to be a Friedrika, or a Wilhelmina, right? The one differentiation is Dor Dorothea, which is Dorothy. Uh, but the rest are all Friedrichs, Wilhelms, or Friedrich Wilhelms, right? Okay, or the occasional Friedrika, which is a girl's name. All right, so, uh, so Friedrich Wilhelm, the Great Elector. Why do they call him the Great Elector? Because, because he was an elector of all right, an elector of Brandenburg, Prussia. That's his territory, and as an elector, he wears the cool white Dalmatian cap, right, and the cool furs. And he's one of seven that get to do what for the Holy Roman Empire? Elect their king, their emperor. So, as a great elector, is he kind of a big deal? Yes. Yeah. He gets to wear a big furry Dalmatian. <laughs> That's a big deal. Right? That is a big deal. Okay, so Friedrich Wilhelm, the great elector, he is going to come to the throne in 1640. Tough time to come to the throne, am I right? That's at the point where the Thirty Years' War has reaped its terrible effects, or wrought its terrible effects, excuse me, upon the dirty Germans. And so he is going to come to the throne during the Thirty Years' War, and he realizes, I got to have me an army to play with. And so he's going to get himself, uh, be able to centralize Prussia by building a huge army. Now, huge by the perspective of the fact that he is a tiny state. Tiny state. So huge given the size of their population, which is about the 13th or 14th uh, smallest. Wait, 13th or, uh, no, let's put it this way. They're about the 13th or 14th largest population in Europe by the time they get to 1700, which means they're not very big, right? Not very big in terms of population. So what he's going to have to do is try and build an army that is effective uh, based upon discipline, which is not easy to do at this time, based upon cheapness. They're not spending a ton of money on it because he ain't got much. And then power and authority derived from his personage, which is absolutism. So they're going to build an 8,000-man army during the Thirty Years' War over the course of eight years. That's pretty good. Pretty good. 8,000-man army. Uh, but by 1688, when he comes off of the throne, they will have become a second-rate power. Now, that doesn't sound very cool. Second-rate. Yeah, we're second-rate. Uh, it is actually pretty cool if you're that small, though, isn't it? Right? Yeah. Why? What were they before? Like fourth rate at best, maybe fifth rate. They were low on the totem pole in Europe in terms of uh, power and prestige. But by 1688, second rate power, meaning that they are up on the rise here. Now the reason they got that, that got there is because they helped France defeat Sweden, even though Sweden were a bunch of Protestants, and even though you'd think they would have been allies to the Swedes because they're so close, why do they not want to help Sweden? So they don't have money. France has money. Uh, they don't have money. France does have money. And competition. Where do they want to be? On the Baltic Sea, exactly. And so to do that, you've got to beat whom at this time? Sweden, exactly. And so they're going to help finance that war and go against Sweden in the Thirty Years' War. And they will become the dominant power in northern Germany by 1688. All right, so they had an army of 22,000 men by the time he finished on the throne. 20, from 8,000 uh, by the time, by the end of the Thirty Years' War, up to 22,000 by 1688. That's a pretty big increase for such a small state, isn't it? 
But not only do they have people, what else do they have that makes them an effective fighting force? Guns. They got guns, they are well supplied, they have discipline, right? They have discipline, they have uniforms, they have standard issued materials, they are ready to fight in any kind of war. Now you don't need to fight a huge war, you just gotta fight battles that are selected. You choose the one that'll help you the most, and you go and kick some serious tail, right? Are they 13 smallest or 13 biggest? 13 biggest, yeah. Yeah, because see, I got it wrong by saying smallest. That would mean they're really the most. Yeah, but no, 13 to 14 small. Biggest. Ah. 13 to 14 small. Yeah. 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 Yeah.